Okay, so a review of what we talked about on Tuesday, we introduced the concept of the guest cycle. And so part of the field trips, when we go on field trips, um, if you will identify, um, if we see any guests, you can identify what, what portion or what section of the guest cycle they are in. So if they're walking to the front desk with their luggage in their hand, what, what section might they be in? What step? Walking to the front desk. Okay, so if we walk in, so yeah, they walk in from the door to the front desk, then yes, that's in the arrival stage. If they are walking from their room to the front desk, what stage? Occupancy. Okay, so the end of occupancy and moving into departure. So you can identify, if we see someone and they're walking down the hallways just to the elevator, but they don't have any luggage in their hands, then they're probably within that occupancy stage. Okay, and so you can identify what stage the, the, the guests are in based on, um, you know, some context clues. And so as we go to these field trips, I want you to kind of, kind of keep an eye, an, eye, an eye out for the, um, the guests that are there and see what, you know, what stage they might be in. All right, so everyone has an index card, right? Who does not have an index card with a number on it? All right. Here we go. So, I gave you a little heads up on this um, activity on Tuesday. So, what we're going to do now is, as a class, we're going to identify and define some of the terms um, that uh, deal with the different room types that we might see um, on our different field trips. Okay? So, on change means that the guest has left, but it is not quite ready for a new guest. It's on change, going from one status to another. Good. Okay. Uh, who has number two? It's up here. Three, four, five. Who has number six? Okay. Rebecca. Uh, that means there's somebody in there. Okay, good. Occupied. Now, kind of, it's interesting, how many of you work in a hotel, okay? Um, sometimes, and it's happened a couple times, if I'm in a hurry during the check-in process, I forget to move the status of the room, so I check a guest in, they go up to the room, and I've got this long line, so I'm focusing on that, and then all of a sudden, um, somebody else comes in, and I check in a room availability, and it doesn't show that it's occupied, because I didn't change it. And so then I actually give someone else keys to that same room. Mm -hmm. And so as that person's coming down, I get a phone call. Somebody's trying to get into my room. <laughs> and then as they come down, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're the person that was trying to get in that other person's room because it was my fault. Then the issue that, ha that we run into then is when I reprogram that keys, it cancels out the keys that I programmed before for the previous guest that is in there. So taking the time and working with our team members to understand that they need to be focused during the check-in process is so important in staying organized because now, rather than me having that other guest come down and bring me the, uh, her old keys, you know, I took it upon myself to reprogram keys and I called her and said, I will be right up there. I'm gonna bring you brand new keys that will work for the duration of your stay, okay? And so that was other issues that, that were uh, part of that. All right, good, occupied. Um, who has number, what number are we on? Seven? Okay. Go ahead, Gabriella. Pick a term and tell us what it means. Um, uh, do not disturb. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, does that mean that when you put the sign up that they, you don't want any kind of uh, house? Exactly. Exactly. So oftentimes when you're at the housekeeping side, um, when I was at La Quinta, we had to go to a room three times. And at the D&D, &D, the do not disturb, D&D &D was still on the door for the, after the third time. I would document each time that I went. That way if the guest came back into the front desk and said, hey, I did not get housekeeping service today, the, house, the front desk can say, our housekeeper went by at 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock, and your do not disturb sign was on there. Um, we can get someone up to service your room now, but having that documentation is important um, so that we can we can keep keep those records. 
Um, otherwise, someone would be like, I didn't get service. You know, why didn't I get service? Well, that's the reason why. They might have left for the day and forgot that the DMD sign was on their door. Um, so, yeah, so good. Uh, where are we at? Seven, eight. Who has eight? Okay. Okay, good. So stay over is um, a term where we, the guest is not checking out. And so why is it important for housekeeping to know when a room is a stay over? They clean it differently, yeah. right? So when uh, it's a stay over, they just have to make the bed, pick up the trash and replace any amenities. So it's a super quick turnover. If it's a checkout, that means the guest has left the room. We need to get it completely ready for the next guest. So I'm going to go ahead and cross off checkout. Okay. Um, where are we at? Nine? Mm -hmm. Out of order. Out of order. What does that mean? That um, something needs to be serviced. Good. There needs to be some kind of, we cannot sell that room, or we should not sell that room. Can we, is there an instance where we could potentially think about it without just shouting out, um, think about it for a moment, critical thinking. Is there a time where we could potentially sell an out of order room to a guest? Yes or no? What do you think? Yes for thumbs up, no for thumbs down. Okay. So the answer is yes, we could potentially sell an out of order room to a guest. If it is our very last room in the hotel, and if it's just because the desk lamp doesn't have a light bulb in it, and it's a specialized light that that maintenance has to order and we rent out, then we just let the guests know. By the way, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the desk lamp is out on the desk, but everything else in the room is functioning just fine. And so if it's something minor like that, now if there was a water leak and the carpet is all you know, trying to be cleaned and everything like that. Of course, we don't want to sell that room. But whatever the reason for the out of order is, there is the potential that we could sell that room. We might even potentially, depending on what the item, what the reason is, we might potentially actually discount the room just a little bit, just for the convenience of the uh, inconvenience of the guests. Yes, Jacqueline. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do this. With no door. Right there. Like no door into the hallway? Yeah. No door. Wow. Wow. Obviously, we get like a bit of percent off of you. Know. Right. <laughs> but I'm thinking like legality wise, like you're opening yourself up to potential lawsuits if you don't have that security. Yeah, I mean, we, we had him sign, uh, you know, paperwork. I was like, okay, I agreed that we're going to be buying this room under this terms. Yeah. And, like, I had to do like real quick. Right. He signed it. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. All right. What number are we at? Ten. Okay. Go ahead, Stephanie. Um, complimentary. Complimentary. What does complimentary mean? The hotel. The hotel is essentially paying for the room. We're not charge. Complimentary means we're not charging for the room. Okay. That's a a a, a room status type where we're not charging for the room. What would be an example of when we would have a complimentary status? Really bad service. Okay, it might be service recovery. Maybe they had a previous experience that was not so great, or maybe they were there for a couple of nights and their first night was not so great that we might have a complimentary status on that room. Um, so that way we know at the front desk that there's a reason why there is that guest is not getting charged for that room. Okay, so it might be service recovery. Why else? Also, VIPs. Okay, so very important people. If it's a potential client, and let's say we have, you know, we're going to um, invite them to come visit our hotel because um, they're going to bring their meeting to our hotel and they want to stay and see what the rooms are like, stay overnight, get a tour of the hotel, we might offer them a complimentary room. If it means that they're going to bring me business in the 5, 10, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of business, well, what's one room night compared to that return on my investment, right? And so we might have complimentary. The other one is if we have gift certificates. So in our industry, our hospitality industry is always hit up for gift certificates, for silent auctions, for nonprofit organizations, for community events. 
And so if we have a gift certificate, then we'd have that complimentary status and typically the gift certificate number on there to verify. Okay. Also in terms of we have like big, big groups and you know, like GM would compliment like the, to like the head of the group. Yeah, so if we have a large group in house, um, oftentimes when we have a large group, um, there's what's called a commission. And so typically, depending on the hotel, the typical commission is one for every 40 or one for every 50 room nights. Okay, so that means for every 40 room nights, you get one complimentary room. And so if like the meeting planner is there or the CEO of the company is there, then it doesn't necessarily, and that's 40 room nights, okay? So let me just kind of take a quick tangent real quick. So let's say Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, I have 45, I have 45, and I have 65, okay? Rooms on those nights. Um, so if I have 90 plus 65, what is that? 155, right? So 155 is my total. So in this case, either way, I would have three complimentary room nights. So it's not just necessarily they have to have you know 40 nights on each night. It's the total of what they do, um, and then that is their their commission. Okay. Good. Um, Eleven. Okay. Lockout. Lockout. Ooh, this is a tricky one. Not a tricky one, but this is a tricky situation. So what's a lockout? So whenever, I mean, for whatever reason, uh, we do not have payment from a guest, and you know, if you for whatever reason are not in the room, but his belongings are still in the room, we have to get him and lock him out of the room so he doesn't have access and he has to stop at the front desk. Absolutely. So lockout is a, a, a situation where we can actually lock the guest out of their room. Um, and there's a variety of different reasons behind that. You know, we talked last class about monitoring the credit limit uh, based on when we pre-authorize a card at the arrival stage. And so if they're getting close to that credit limit, we could potentially lock them out of the room. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a way for them to have to come back to the front desk to get their keys reprogrammed. They come back and say, my keys aren't working. And we're not going to say, well, we locked you out because you're getting close to your credit limit. You know, we're not going to say it like that. We might just say, oh, you know what? We need to reauthorize the card because of your purchases. We're getting close to that credit limit. We just need to do a simple reauthorization and I can reissue your keys. Right. You don't want to make the guests feel bad um, about that. Um, and maybe also that there was a lot of complaints about the guests. Maybe overnight the previous night, there's a lot of complaints, noise complaints or whatever, and or we actually need to physically remove them from the property. Okay, they are no longer welcome on the property. You might have to lock them out. Um, and so that's just basically that lockout means they've got to come back to the front desk. Their keys no longer work. Okay. Uh, let's see. Twelve. Yes. Right. Good. So typical checkouts and depending on the hotels, anywhere between 11 o'clock and noon. Um, sometimes you can request a late checkout. So like when I run, when I go, I run a marathon or something. I know I'm going to finish the marathon at 11 o'clock. So I'm going to ask for a one o'clock late checkout so I have time to get back and gather my things and whatnot. And typically when there's special events happening, they're aware of those special circumstances. Can they always, can we, can we always accommodate a late checkout? We can't. Okay. Um, and if we can't, oftentimes, you know, if you get to like the diamond or platinum status of the rewards, then it's guaranteed whether they can, whether, you know, they, they're guaranteed a late checkout. Um, but, uh, but sometimes we can't, because what if we have to clean every single room and get it ready for the next group to come in four hours later, right? And so sometimes we can't honor late checkouts. Um, some hotels will actually charge for a late checkout. So if you want to stay, you know, if you want to stay an hour after, that's okay. But if you're going to stay more than an hour after, we're going to charge you twenty-five dollars, whatever the whatever the policy is at the hotel. You charge a full day. They'll charge a full day, okay? After 5 p.m., so that way they're going to get that revenue for that, that, that room because they may not be able to sell that room 
later on if you if you're checking out so late. So yeah, so depending on what the the policy is, and that policy needs to be stated and it needs to be easily accessible by the guests. Okay, uh, twelve. We're at twelve. Thirteen. Uh, not okay. So what does that mean? Okay. So they just left, right? They just left. They just walked out the front door with all their stuff. They did not actually stop by the front desk to check out. What's an issue with that? You don't know if the guest is still there or the room is still occupied or not. The housekeepers don't know if they can go in. So uh, especially now, most most hotels are moving towards digitalizing their, their property management system and it talks to each other. So they can actually see when most people can check out with their phones, but the housekeepers, if they have tablets, if they're digitalized with their property management system, then the housekeepers will actually see when guests check out of their rooms. And so if a guest doesn't do that, then the housekeeper is waiting, 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 waiting until that guest is finally checked out, but then they've left and they didn't know. And so it just wastes the time on the housekeeper's um, perspective, okay? Um, what is, uh, let's see, I'm just gonna go through these real quick because we're gonna move on to the number 13. We'll start with number 13 on the next slide. Um, vacant ready means it is clean and we're ready to sell it again. It is vacant and it is ready, okay? Um, so we, the, the normal process is you move to check out and then to on change and then to vacant ready. And once it's on vacant ready, then we're able to sell that room again. Sleep out means that the guests did not sleep in their room, right? Their luggage is in there, but the bed is still made perfectly. So for whatever reason, the guests did not sleep in their room, okay? Um, skipper means somebody who has left without paying their bill, which is kind of challenging to do, mostly because because their credit card's on file, unless it's like a stolen credit card or you know, some kind of fraud as well, okay? What does sleeper mean? What does sleeper mean? It can be during the hours of gaming. Oh, probably is it, is it someone that, oh, you know, is it supposed to check out, but for whatever reason, like he's not answering the phone. So Isn't it just a hotel room status? Does it get change it after the person checks out? The guest checked out, but they didn't clean it. The guest checked out, but they didn't clean it? Is that what the book says? No. No, it's just a hotel status. Hotel one. Hotel one. Okay, so say that again. Oh, that's what we said. Say that again. Settled his or her account and left the hotel, but the front office has failed to properly update the room status. Okay. So it would be a discrepancy between the actual room status and and what the what the room is, because we want to make sure we avoid those discrepancies, um, because again, if that if it shows that room is is occupied and we don't sell it, but it's been perfectly cleaned and ready to go, then we lose that revenue for that day. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. All right, room types. Number thirteen. Who has number thirteen? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we had number thirteen. Yeah. Who's number? Due out. What's that? Due out. Oh, due out means that they are due to check out. Okay. Um, fourteen. Go ahead, Patricia. Um, connecting rooms. That means the rooms have a door between them that you can go in and out. Okay, connecting rooms. Perfect. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and address adjoining and adjacent yeah. right now all together because these are the ones that people most confuse, right? Yeah. <laughs> so a connecting door means there is actually a door that goes between the rooms, okay? There's a physical door. They share a wall and there's a door. Mm -hmm. So let's do this little picture right here. So here's our hotel rooms, right? Here's our two rooms. This is our hallway. Okay, so if we have, um, a door that connects the rooms, 
This right here is connecting. Okay, that's connecting. Adjoining means that there is a physical wall, they share a wall, but there is no door. Okay, so adjoining right here would be considered these right here. Okay, because there's a physical wall, but there's no door that connects them. Okay, the last one is adjacent. Okay, so technically adjacent just means nearby or next to, right? So these could be adjacent rooms, but these also could be adjacent rooms. Okay, and so the guests might just say, I need, I need an adjacent room, okay? And so it's up to that reservation in that pre-arrival section or at the arrival step when we see that they have two rooms, they've requested adjoining rooms, we might have to ask some additional questions, okay? We might see if they've got children with them when they're checking in, well, then they might want these connecting rooms. So there is that door, okay? Um, you might say, I noticed on your reservation, you have adjoining rooms requested. Would you like connecting rooms? Because that has the door between the two, okay? Because if it's adjoining, we might actually just put them across from each other. And if you've got parents with, a, with small children, we definitely don't want to have that situation. Now, if you have parents with teenagers, they might be okay with the older kids. They might be okay with that, right? But you just, you just never know. So that's why you have to ask those questions, okay? Good. Number uh, 15. Um, studio. Studio, okay. So what is the studio? It's like Good, okay. So it's like um, an apartment, but a, um, a studio is almost like a, well, it's like a studio apartment mm -hmm. where everything is all together in one large room. Like an efficiency. Okay, like an efficiency, right? It might be, they might have, um, Things like a refrigerator, a little cooktop area. They might have a like apartment style stuff like that, or it just might be the bed and the and the um, the sitting area. But it's all in one big one big open space. Okay, a studio. All right, where are we at? Sixteen, fifteen, sixteen. Yes, Jacqueline. Yep, pick one and tell us what it is. With, uh, two, two beds. Okay, so either two double beds, two queen beds, it could also mean double occupancy, okay? Um, so it really kind of depends on the hotel. Now, I'm going to say single is one that I've only seen, uh, I typically see when you're traveling um, internationally, okay? So um, a few years ago, I visited my best friend in Scotland. And she and her husband and I went up to the northwest coast of Scotland, and I checked into the hotel, and I had a single, and they had a double. So they had one double bed, because there's two of them in the room, and I had a single room. So I literally had a twin-size bed in my room. And the room was even smaller, because you, you didn't need the space for a big bed. So the room was even smaller, right? And so a single literally means there was one person in there, and there was a single twin size bed in the room. It wasn't even like a double bed. Um, what's that? I don't mind. <laughs> I mean, a twin size, I fit on a twin size bed. I mean, it's not, a twin size is half of a king. So, I mean, you can sleep on a twin size bed. It's no big deal. Um, so triple then and quad is what? Three people per room, four people per room. Okay, triple and quad. Um, where are we? 1617? Okay. Yes. Um, I'm with King. Um, it's a hotel room with a king size bed. Good. And it gives the option if three people want to sleep on the bed. Okay, perfect. So king size bed in the room. Good. Um, 18. No, 18? 19? Um, a suite? It's um, two rooms, usually two rooms in one room that separates the bedroom from the um, a sitting area or a supplement. Exactly. So a suite is going to have a designated sleeping area and sitting area, <clears throat> like a parlor or seating area. Um, and most typically suites 
Um, they can be a studio suite, meaning it's all one big room, or it could be a, a, a true suite where there is a door that actually closes between the living, the living area and the sleeping area, okay? Um, what would be a benefit of having a suite? You need a little bit more space, okay, to spread out if you've got kids or family. A lot of times the sofa is a pull out. Good. The sofa in that sitting area is often a pull out sofa, so you can have additional people, additional bedding for people to sleep. Good. Anything else? Kitchen. Okay. Yeah. So if it's a if it's an extended stay hotel, oftentimes <laughs> there is a small kitchen in there as well, and so that gives you more. Space and you know if you can do like let's say residence in by Marriott or Homewood <coughs> or Home Two Suites by Hilton, Staybridge, um, Staybridge Suites by IHG, um, they all have small little kitchens in them. Um, I think Candlewood Suites actually also has um, small kitchenettes, um, but they essentially, you know, <laughs> I know Homewood and Home Two Suites. I I can speak to personally. They actually have China. They have plates, they have glassware, they have silverware, they have a dishwasher, so they have a full like a, a full size refrigerator. So if you're gonna be there for extended time, you can actually go grocery shopping and you can actually stock your fridge like you are at home and you can prepare meals there at the at the hotel. Okay, and then you actually eat on China plates and you actually use real silverware instead of you know plates, uh, paper plates or plastic. And so it just kind of makes you feel like you're at home. Okay, good. Um, 20. It's a queen. Okay. It's a room with queen size bed. Good. It can be a queen size bed. Um, good. Number 21. Double double. Good. Good. Okay, so we might have two double beds in that room. Okay, so double occupancy would mean that there's two people in the room. But double double designates that there are two beds in that room, and you can have one person in that bed in that room, or you could have more than one person in that room. Um, Sherry Chaudry is the owner and builder um, of the Comfort Suites here in downtown, and when she and I were talking about her hotel, she was strategic in knowing that she wanted to attract school groups um, and cheerleading groups and things like that. So when she built her hotel, she intentionally has more double doubles than kings because you could always put one person in a double double but you cannot put more than two or three people in a king and so if her goal is to attract cheer groups and high school and school groups you know she wants to be able to use those rooms as best as possible and so she has more double doubles than the kings in her hotel and so it really kind of depends on who the market that you're serving is if you are an airport hotel and you serve as primarily the corporate market, you might have more kings than doubles. Okay. Um, Twenty-two. Yes. A twin. A room with a twin in it. There we go. Twenty-three. Uh, mini suite. <clears throat> a single room with a bed. Good. Okay. Um, mini suites, junior suites. They are also often at times a little bit larger than a traditional suite, okay? Um, junior suites, you also have presidential suites, which are gonna be the largest suite in the hotel, if your hotel has a presidential. Um, and so those junior suites might be in between uh, presidential and the, um, like the traditional suites, okay? 24? And you've already gone over it, you're putting one. So okay, 25? Anybody, no? And I've got 26, 27 up here. Okay, so we are good, excellent. Questions, comments, concerns about that? So now these room types, these are just general. We have additional room types. I mean, a hotel can have as many room types as you need. So for example, the Hilton Palacio del Rio downtown, they're gonna have river view rooms and they're gonna have um, city view rooms, okay? And so there's gonna be, there might be river kings and city kings. There might be river double doubles and city double doubles, right? And so it really depends on what the hotel is um, and with the makeup and the, the types of rooms that you have. I think the, the Wyndham Garden Inn on the museum reach of the Riverwalk, I think they have like 13 or 14 different room types. And they're, uh, they're technically a full service because they have a restaurant 
uh, but the, the, the private contract with the restaurant, uh, Bourbon Street. And so the hotel is more of like that select service style, but and they have me they have some meeting space. But yeah, they have like 13 or 14 different room types in that small little hotel. Um, you know, so the, the room types are specific to the hotels. These are just some general examples. Questions, comments, concerns? Typically, not always, but I know like the La Quinta where I worked, um, I want to say it was the 26s. So room 226, 326, 426, 526, those were all the same type of room. And they were all the two room suites with a jacuzzi tub in the bath tub, in the bathroom. And so that way, if I knew if I wanted to upgrade a guest, if a 26 was available, I could upgrade them to that, right? And so typically, the room numbers on each floor are pretty identical. Yes? I have a comment. Another St. Anthony, I know that they have, like, the hotel is shaped like a beast. Mm -hmm. So certain rooms are facing, like, either the alley or they don't have a window. So the room type that you requested isn't available. They would give a discount rate if you want to have, like, a room on the inside. That's another, have a best view. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a good point. Uh, St. Anthony Hotel was built in three different parts. So it actually is built like an E. Mm -hmm. And so, like she's saying, sometimes you're looking out into an alleyway or you're looking off into the other side of the building and that maybe isn't the most desirable view. Um, and so as a result, they might offer a discount if they don't have your room type available. Yeah, good, good, good comment. Okay, during the occupancy stage. So this is the main part of the, this is that part of the guest cycle. This is the main time the guest is going to be with us, okay? Um, we want to make sure that whatever we do during this phase, it um, encourages the guests to book either book with us, remain brand standard with our brand, um, or to give their friends and families good reviews and good positive feedback about their stay. So if anything goes wrong during the stay, we have an opportunity to do some service recovery if need be. Okay. Um, with this, as services, as guests give any kind of feedback or complaints, we have a logbook at the front desk. And whether it's a digital logbook or whether it's a physical spiral notebook that we just write everything in, we have that logbook. And so that way we can see when that, res when that has been resolved or if it's not been resolved. So as a front desk agent, when I come in for my shift, my first responsibility is to read that logbook to see what's been going on. So if Mrs. Smith comes down and starts complaining to me because I'm a new employee, I can, I've already read the, the guest, I've already read the logbook, and it says that this issue was resolved. Okay, um, this was resolved, or it has not been resolved yet. So when Mrs. Smith comes down to complain that it has not been resolved, I can see that it hasn't been, and I can make sure I go through the process to recover that that guest service. Okay. Um, we also, uh, during that occupancy, if we know that anything is happening during that time, okay, so whether it's a celebration, what the, the purpose of their, their visit, if they're celebrating an anniversary. Um, I had a student once was doing her practicum at a courtyard downtown, and she, during the check-in process, she realized it was the, the little boy's 10th birthday. And so upon check-in, after they got settled in the room, she sent up a plate of warm cookies, a glass of milk, and a, a couple of balloons, right, with a handwritten note that said, thank you for celebrating your 10th birthday with us. So we can identify things to make their stay memorable um, during, that, during this occupancy phase. Um, also, I've also experienced this as well. Um, if there's any kind of maintenance or construction or renovations that are happening in your hotel, um, this is during the occupancy phase, we want to keep the guests informed as best as possible. So I'll give you two short examples. One was in Austin, and it was an Embassy Suites. And so Embassy Suites is known for the, 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 the traditional Embassy Suites is known for their giant atriums. So when you walk in, there's rooms all the way around, but it goes all the way to the top of, the, of the, this giant ceiling, right? Well, right in the bottom of that, at 6 o'clock in the morning, they were going to use jackhammers to deal with the concrete floor. So of course, at check-in, we all got a letter saying, this is what's going to happen. We are apologizing in advance for any inconvenience, okay? The other one, I thought this was really brilliant, um, just 
in San Diego just last in June. I went to run the rock and roll um, half marathon. And we get a notification that the power was going to be cut in the middle of the night due to utility service somewhere off the property. They were going to be cutting the power at 2 o'clock in the morning. So literally, I was watching TV, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, boom, power goes out. Right, But we were all notified in advance um, to let us know this was going to be happening. Right, The hotel said they have additional flashlights at the front desk. You could come pick one up. They, you know, they wanted to make sure that you had your phones charged because they were going to be without electricity. All these things they were giving us precautions for. And then when I left at like 5 in the morning um, to go get to the start line, I walked out my door, and I thought this was so brilliant. They had all those little mini glow sticks. Not like the bracelets, but the actual glow sticks. And they had them lining every 10 feet, every 5 to 10 feet in the hallway. Nice. So you could actually see in the hallway. And as I'm walking out the front door, the front desk is there, and they're just like cracking these things like crazy. And I'm like, this is brilliant. I never would have thought about that. <laughs> but I mean, how cool is that? You know? So if you're ever in a situation where you're in a hotel and your hotel power is going to be cut, you know, you might think about ways that you can be a little creative in, in illuminating the walkways and illuminating the areas. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Anyone else have any examples of communication of special things that are happening in the property during the occupancy phase that you've experienced? Or any hotels, any hotel your students, things that you've done at your hotels when there are specific things? Yes, Jacqueline. And we had to give letters of notice for at the time when uh, New Year's. Okay. Like when it was a big green engine. Yeah. Uh, uh, that you could not access, have access to, even though you have valet, you not have access to your vehicle because the There you go. Good. So even though you have your parked your car valet, you won't have access to it because all those streets will be closed because it's the 300 celebration. Okay, good. Anybody else? No? Okay. Sorry. Um, so during the during the occupancy stage, the documents that we're working with is the main one is our folio. Okay. So our folio is essentially just our account. That's the, the fancy way of that's the industry terminology for saying our account. So every guest has a folio. Um, and that tracks all of their charges um, that they have. It charges their room, their tax, it also charges anything that they charge to the room. Also, any payments that they give. Um, so it tracks all of that process um, in the end. So they all have a folio. Okay. Um, in the departure stage, so this is the very final stage of the guest cycle. And uh, this is our last opportunity to make sure that they're going to leave our hotel happy. Okay. So there's a hotel that I will never stay in. Ever, ever, ever again. Ever, ever, ever. Okay? It was a Homewood Suites in, in um, Savannah, Georgia. So I went, and there was hair in my bathroom in, like, four different spaces. I took pictures, and I texted them to the front desk. You know, I'm going to dinner. Please take care of this. I come back, and I actually took out all the towels, right? I, uh, I took, and the, the bath mat, the bath towel looked a little dingy, and then I saw the hairs, and I was like, okay, this yeah. is gross. So I actually took all towels off the shelves and unfolded them and put them in a big pile. Well, I come back and I have brand new towels, but the hair is still there. So I send them a message. It's 10 o'clock at night. I have a marathon tomorrow. Please. I know that I'm a stay over, but can you please tell housekeeping to do an extra good job cleaning the bathroom? And so I run my marathon. I come home. I don't want to do anything except sleep. And there's hair still in the bathroom in the exact same spot. And so I called the front desk and I said, this is absolutely ridiculous. I cannot believe. I was like, I just did a marathon. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see anybody. I just want to sleep. But I will let you know I'm going out for dinner. And I, would, I expect my room to be clean when I come back. And so I did. I went to dinner. I came back. My room was clean. Do you know what my guest service recovery was? Two bottles of Fiji water. <laughs> Two bottles of Fiji water that were left out on the table. So they were like lukewarm. You know, the condensation was kind of starting to dry up a little bit so that they were cold at one point, but they weren't cold anymore, right? 
And so then I went to check out, and this is a home with, this is an older home with suites where they have like different buildings. It's almost like a little apartment complex, right? So I actually had to physically go out of my way to go to the front desk to check out. I checked out, and they're like, okay, you're all set. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. no additional, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for your patience. None of that. I was like, are you kidding me? No, like, that is it? And then I looked, and I realized I had done, I had prepaid for my reservation, right? So if I, since I prepaid for my reservation, there's nothing they could do. They couldn't credit me any money or things like that. They couldn't discount my rate. And so I thought, well, maybe is that the reason why they're not, like, they're not doing anything? Because I prepaid for my reservation. Yes. Right. Right. Good point. And so what ended up, so I was sitting out in the car for the longest time, not the longest, maybe like five minutes, but I was like, you know, I was like fuming. I mean, I have a very high level expectation of guest service, but I also have a little bit of, I have a little bit more patience. I like to believe I have a little bit more patience just to give people a professional courtesy of, I know we're not always on a hundred percent of the time. We all have off days. Um, and so I sat in my car for the long, for about five minutes and I finally was just like, you know what? I'm going to send a message through my Hilton Honors app. And I emailed Hilton Corporate directly. And within a day, I had 10, they were like, we'll give you 10,000 bonus points on your Hilton honors. And so I thought, wow, that's awesome. 10,000 points, that's that's quite a bit of, of, of points. And then fast forward like a couple weeks, I was at a hotel here in San Antonio, a two night little just kind of city mini staycation before Thanksgiving. And there's hair in my bathroom again. I had, that year, I had a lot of issues with hair in the bathroom. <laughs> um, and so, of course, it's 10 o'clock at night. And so I'm like, just clean it tomorrow. So the next day, I went to the, to the gym. I never go to the gym when I'm at a hotel. But I figured, I'm going to be here for two days. I always want to relax. So I went to the gym. I stopped by the front desk. And I said, hey, by the way, I'm going to go work out. Um, can you please address the issue um, in, my, in my room? And they said, OK, great. So I came back an hour later. And there's still hair in my bathroom. So I went back to the front desk. And you know what her response to me was? Housekeeping doesn't come in until 9. And I just looked at her and I said, excuse me? I said, I'm sorry. You're telling me that there's not a single person in this hotel that can't go clean my bathroom right now? I said, I teach my students that if you're the general manager of a hotel and there's no one available, you put some gloves on and you go clean that room. Wait, whoever threw that was a man? No, no, it was a front desk agent. It was a front desk agent. And I was like, you're telling me there's no housekeeping person. There's no overnight houseman. There's nobody in here that can come clean my room. And so I went and sat in my room for about an hour. And I was just like, you know, so I posted on, I posted on Facebook to my friends just to get some validation. I should not have posted the name of the hotel, but I did. Um, and so I was like, am I being ridiculous? Am I being, you know, overly sensitive? And of course, all my friends were like, no, 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 no. And of course, because I, I posted the name of the hotel, people in the industry who knew those people were like adding their names to the comments. And I'm like, okay, let me take this out. And, and, they're like, and so eventually I just went back to the front desk and I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to leave. I'm checking out a day early. I just, I just don't even want to be here. My parents live five minutes away. I was just going to have like a nice relaxing staycation before I went to my craziness of Thanksgiving at my parents' house. I'm just going to check out early. So you lost revenue for a day because of that. Um, and her response to me was like, I can give you 10,000 Hilton Honors bonus points. And I'm like, is that the new service recovery band-aid? Just throw points at people? Like it works the first couple of times, but after that it's like, that doesn't work anymore. I mean, you still need to do something for me, you know, uh, to make it right. And again, I, and I, I teach also my students about this as well. I encourage you to have a little bit more patience I mean, up to a certain point, things still need to go right. But we, as a professional courtesy, do not be that person that yells and screams to get your way because they're going to experience that regardless. And so you might go to them and say, hey, you know what? I work in a hotel. Um, I, I am a hotel management professor or I'm a hotel management student. And I, as a professional courtesy, I'm just letting you know this is an issue. Okay? And hopefully they would appreciate that over you just going and having an attitude and yelling and screaming. Because what you're trying to do is prevent that happening for that person who would react that way. Okay, One professional courtesy to another. Okay? I'm a very big 
uh, believer in karma and just be, you know, giving that professional courtesy, whether it's a food and ser- whether it's a food and beverage experience at a restaurant or at a hotel, any kind of service experience. So, any questions, comments, concerns? With the departure stage, that's our last opportunity to make sure that we know that everything was okay. That's our last chance to make it right. Because once they walk out that door, they're going to post on their social media. They're going to post everywhere. Now, if they post on their social media that they had issues, hopefully you have someone in your department, in your hotel, that's going to respond to that. Thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. We're going to look into that right away. Or you can say, yes, Mrs. Smith, thank you. We're so sorry we had that. Um, We're glad we were able to accommodate you by offering half off your rate for the night. So that shows people who are reading those reviews that you've actually responded to it, right? And that's just that person who's just being that person, okay? So during this um, stage, we can either print out receipts for the guests. Now most people just get an email to themselves. Um, We can email the receipts. We can print out. It's super important that we make sure that this is when we actually charge the account that's on file, okay? So like when I travel for Alamo Colleges, I have to bring in, I have to submit all my receipts and it has to say zero on the bottom. It has to show that I actually paid for my my hotel. Um, And so we need to make sure we have that. Um, Any kind of third party billing gets sent to our um, accounts payable, okay? So we might have an account that deals with all of our Expedia accounts or all of our TripAdvisor, or not TripAdvisor, or um, Orbit or Kayak. And so we're going to compile all that and then we can send that out as an account payable. Our finance office will manage that. Okay. <clears throat> and then once the guest is checked out, all that information about their stay goes into their history file. So if they've been a past guest of our hotel, then we can pull up their past uh, history and we know that they like to stay on the high floor if they want to be away from the ice machine if they want to yes I was say, for certain guests like if they've had like a service recovery issue we can make note like depending on the severity of the service recovery like <clears throat> like if it's something substantial like repair like your case but if it was just like somebody that was waiting for ballet that you want or it's noted in their account that like if it's, or if it's like a or if it's really bad then it goes into the manager log and they know like oh when this guest arrives it comes up it doesn't fly. Absolutely. So we can keep track of all that information. I think I can't remember, I think I've done this maybe once or twice on my Hilton Honors app. I can actually favorite a room. So I can say that I really like this room. And the next time I stay in this hotel, I'm gonna to try to wanna to stay in that room. So I can actually favorite that room. So Kind of interesting. Um, late charges happen after the guest has checked out and we've already closed their account. Okay. Now, if your property management system is all integrated, you know, as soon as like well, sometimes I'm at if I'm at a courtyard and I'll pay the ten dollars for the breakfast, my, my discounted rate for the Hilton Honors, I'll pay ten dollars for a breakfast buffet before I leave. Literally. I pay my thing at the ho- at the at the restaurant, and I walk to the front desk, and my account has already been those charges have already been posted to my folio because everything talks to each other. Okay, now if there is a situation where like you have a third party valet, and they have to actually give all of those valet tickets to the front desk, if they don't do that on time, then a late charge could occur, meaning we have to now charge that guest's account for this additional charge. You have to be able to explain to the guest why we're charging their card another time, okay? And so the most the most proactive we can be to make sure that late late charges don't occur, the less the more happy our guests are going to be, the less issues we are going to have in the long run, okay? But that late charge is not a charge due to the error of the guest; it's a charge due to the error of the hotel. We did not get the information in time to charge them when they checked out. Okay, so the front desk typically is pre- predominantly stayed um, in the lobby of the hotel. So when you walk in, you typically are going to see that, that, that front desk right off the bat. They can be a traditional front desk, like you see right here. But they can also be these kind of kiosk stations. Okay, <laughs> And the benefit of a kiosk station is if I'm right here, oops, 
If I'm right here behind my kiosk and somebody comes in, I can step around and present their keys to them. Okay, it removes that barrier of the front desk between you and the guest. It makes it a little bit more personable. Okay. The new courtyard standard is having the, the podium style. Okay, excellent. We also have um, some that are like in Home 2, for example. Home 2 by, not Home 2, Hyatt Place. Hyatt Place, thank you. Sorry, uh, Hyatt Place is the kind of a suite style hotel by Hyatt. And they have, actually their, their front desk is very low. And the computers are actually inside underneath the desk. And so when you walk in, there's no computers. It's just this flat get this flat, flat desk, and you're talking to the guests, and attached to it, kind of like this kind of wraps around right here, attached to it on the side is the coffee snacks section as well. And so you can purchase snacks and you can purchase coffees and things like that from the, from the same front desk area. Um, so it's just a little bit more casual. The higher the front desk, like you see here, and you see here, it has that physical barrier between you and the guest. And so sometimes people might think that this is a little bit more inviting and welcoming to do it this way than rather than this way. New ADA guidelines, Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines, says that even if you have a desk like this, uh, there needs to be something that's accessible for people in wheelchairs. So oftentimes now at the newer hotels, when you'll walk in, you'll see the front desk and off to the side, you'll see a lower section, a lower section of the front desk, and that's to help accommodate for people who have, are, in, are in wheelchairs. Some hotels are experimenting with no front desk in the lobby, so people will actually have iPads. The front desk agents will have iPads, and as you walk in, if you're checking in, they can check you in that way, okay? Um, I don't. I don't know of a specific one that does that. The, the W in New Orleans, okay. I might look, I might look that one up. Um, so we just talked about that, that a portion of the desk needs to be ADA compliant. Thinking about that overall um, organizational chart we talked about in chapter two, we now have the telephone area. So we have the switchboards. Um, PBX is the private branch exchange. That's the operator. So you might actually see PBX as a position in the hotel. So larger full service hotels have PBX positions where they basically answer the phone and then direct them to the various departments or the, direct, the, the specific rooms they need to go to. So some things we can also do um, with automated is wake up calls. So the guests can either program it themselves from their phones. I've seen that in some hotels where you call them, you pick up the receiver and there's directions on how to use the keypad on the phone to actually schedule your own wake up call. Other times you can call the front desk at the La Quinta. When I worked there, now this was 10 years ago, but when I worked at the La Quinta, people would call and we had a, a wake up call list, a log at the front desk. And there was one for every single day. And so I would have that day, and as the night audit person, overnight, it was my responsibility to program all of those wake-up calls. Or if I was really slow during the afternoon or the evening, I could highlight that I've already entered that wake-up call in, so that way the night audit person already knew that that wake-up call already was, was programmed. Okay, and that's an automated. The hotel front desk is not calling every single room to say, wake up, wake up, okay? No, it's an automated system that does that, okay? Um, High-speed internet, Wi-Fi, that is definitely something that is becoming more and more popular. Um, High-speed uh, internet might be a connection, so you might actually have the cable that you can connect directly into the uh, internet system, or most places have Wi-Fi now. And one of the, like I told y'all before, I think I told y'all before, um, the only reason why I'm a Hilton Honors member is because I joined to get free Wi-Fi. When I, when I stayed four or five, about four years ago, three or four years ago at the Embassy Suites downtown, I had a gift certificate, so I wasn't paying for the room. And when I checked in, they said, well, if you join Hilton Honors, you can get complimentary Wi-Fi. Are there many hotels that still charge it? I can't remember the last hotel I've been at that doesn't offer free Wi-Fi. 
seems like it's a pretty standard thing. It is a pretty standard thing now. It also depends on the level of service. So like a full service hotel might potentially charge, um, but then like you just said, you could potentially upgrade to a higher, um, a faster Wi-Fi, and you can pay that additional fee. I mean, because now that seems like the way we are now that everyone uses it, everyone needs it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you're traveling internationally. Um, I think I did actually, when I stayed, I don't think it was in France, I think it was in Italy. Um, I had to pay for 24 hour access. This was 2013, so about six years ago. I had to pay for 24 hours access um, to the hotel's Wi Fi. And it was a minimal, yeah, for regular Wi Fi. And it was a minimal, I want to say it was like five euros. So it wasn't, it was a minimal charge. But for an international traveler, Especially if I don't have an international data plan, I need to have that Wi-Fi so I can access and, and have access to my, my phone. So yeah. Um, all right, so the call detection software um, is part of the system where we can actually figure out when the call, where the call is coming from and the duration of the call so it can really improve the billing. Now this is when we have to, you know, if we're charging for long distance, so some hotels will have complimentary local calls, but then if you if you dial anything long distance, then it'll be charged to your room. Okay, so that really kind of the the accuracy of this has helped to eliminate billing errors, um, and so we can really pinpoint exactly when those calls were made. All right, property management system PMS. Okay. Hotels have different property management systems. What property management system do you all use at the Hilton? On Q. On Q, what do you guys use? Fossey. Fossey. On Q. On Q. Do you know what y'all use at the the different brands? On Q. On Q. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there, so when we go to the different hotels, you might ask if they don't address it already. You might ask what is their property management system. So their property management system includes all of these um, different systems. They all communicate and talk to each other, okay? Uh, what's that? Light speed, okay. And Opera, yep. Okay, Opera and Light, uh, Opera is the one that I'm most familiar with. Okay, don't be an elitist, right? <laughs> Some people need to use Opera, don't judge them. Um, all right, so property management, we're gonna go through each one of these and then we're going to, this is, that should be the end of the chapter. We'll take a, a short break. Um, so our property management system, they all talk to each other. And as technology is improving, even our property management systems are being updated and the, the improvement is, is even better. Um, we talk, I talked a little bit about housekeepers um, having uh, tablets or iPhones or whatever that they can communicate. So I know Hotel Emma uses this technology where if a guest comes in, well, first of all, the executive housekeeper can pull up all of their housekeepers and they know exactly where they are, what room they're in, um, what room they should be in based on their schedule. Um, and if they're not in the, the appropriate room, they can send them a message. Why are you not in room whatever, you know? So that kind of leads to a little bit of a comment about like micromanaging, right? Um, but at the same time, that productivity and that efficiency, if a guest is a VIP in room 406 and this housekeeper doesn't have 406 until three or four rooms down the line, well, that executive housekeeper can pull up their, their tablet and move 406 to next in line. And it automatically updates the housekeeper's workload and they know that they need to go do 406 right now. And as soon as the supervisor, so the housekeeper cleans the room, the supervisor goes in and double checks it, and as soon as the supervisor checks it on their tablet, the front desk is immediately notified and the front desk can say, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, your room is ready. Okay, and so it, it speeds up that, that process. When I was at the La Quinta, the, the executive housekeeper was the only one who would change room statuses to vacant ready. And so she would have to go get all the reports from all the supervisors on all the different floors and then come down to the front office, the, the front desk, and actually physically change to vacant ready. And then she would go back and, you know, about a half hour, uh, 45 minutes later, she'd do her rounds again, figure out which rooms were vacant ready, and come down. So all of that process, it took a lot of time. 
But technology can definitely speed that up, you know? Or if the supervisor goes into a room and there's hair in the bathroom, they can put that room right back into that housekeeper's line in their queue and say, you need to go back and revisit this room. Okay, rather than that supervisor having to go hunt down where that housekeeper is. So that technology is, is really helpful um, in, in increasing productivity. You know, so the housekeeper literally checks in when they start cleaning the room and they mark it when they're done. That then tells the supervisor they can go check it and, and confirm it. But it also tells you how long that housekeeper spent in that room. Um, and so we want to know if we have a checkout, they have typically like what, 26 minutes, maybe, maybe even shorter, 30 at the max, to clean a room from messy to get it to somebody else in that room. 30 minutes, right? I mean, that's not a lot of time. And so if it's a stay over, 15 to 20 minutes that you've got to get in, clean that room and remake the bed, re restock the amenities and then head off the next one. Um, so. Let's talk about each one of these property management systems and what they do. So they're all pretty self-explanatory. Reservations management helps manage our reservation. So they collect all the data. The, the reservation management system might connect to um, the GDSs, which are global distribution systems. So GDSs are primarily used by travel agents airlines. Okay, and airlines. The IDSs, are used, those are like your Orbitz, travel, uh, Travelocity, Hotwire, those are your internet distribution systems. So the, the average guest is gonna use the IDS. The GDS is what travel agents are going to use, okay? But our reservation systems basically communicates with these, these systems to tell them what availability, what our inventory we have available and what our rate is, okay? We also have central reservation systems. So Marriott has a, has a call center here in San Antonio. Um, and so oftentimes when you call the hotel, you either are gonna speak to someone briefly and they're gonna transfer you to the reservation system or your, your call is automatically gonna be routed. If you hit, you need to make a new reservation, it might automatically be routed to a central reservation system, okay? Um, so in this reservation management, it looks and we can see how many rooms we have available. We can look and see how many rooms we have to expect to arrive. So that can help us with our budgeting, with our with our staffing. If we only have 15 arrivals for the day, do I need, a, do I need to have a fully staffed front desk? Probably not. If I'm gonna have 80 departures the next day, I might need to have a little bit more on my housekeeping team. If I have 15 departures, and you know, 10 stayovers, a very low occupancy, I may not need a whole housekeeping team, right? So we wanna make sure that we are staffing appropriately as well. Our rooms management is gonna basically, this is where we change the statuses in our, um, as we check in, as we check out, we're gonna use this room management software to identify what rooms are available to sell, what rooms, what the status of those rooms are. Um, who's in those rooms, okay? Um, so that's what the room stat, that's what the room reservation, or the room management software does. The accounting is basically just the accounting. It's dealing with all the billing. So anytime the guest charges to the room, um, or if we make a post, what we do, is we, we call it posting in their account, okay? We make a post to their folio. We post a charge to their, or we post a charge, or we post a payment in their folio, in their account, okay? And that accounting software is going to help us. We can also do with this accounting software, we can do what's called a split folio. What do you think that sounds like? What does that, what does that mean, yeah, split right. folio? Somebody who's not in the hotels, what do you think? Yeah, they're paying split with two check. sources. So they're playing like a split check, yeah. okay? And they're maybe paying with two different sources. The thing that you mostly see split folios on is for people who are on business, right? So if I'm traveling on business, Alamo College is gonna reimburse me for my room and my room and tax. They're not gonna reimburse me for my food and alcoholic beverage purchases, okay? And they don't even know how much alcoholic beverages I purchased <laughs> during my visit. And so you ask for a split folio. You're paying all at once, 
but you're going to be charged two different times, right? And so that way you can submit one bill and you don't have to submit the other, okay? General management software is going to help us generate reports. So it's going to help generate reports on occupancy, on ADR, RevPAR, all those things. And um, all of these reports are generated and compiled during the night audit shift, the overnight, the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. And I can't necessarily say this is the exact order your reports are going to go in because that's up to your general manager. Okay, they really are the ones who say this is the order that I want to see reports or this is who needs to get this report, this is who needs to get this report. So it varies by hotels. If you ever want to move up quickly um, and understand the inner workings of a hotel, the night audit shift is a perfect shift to do that because you're going to see these reports every single night. You're going to see what the occupancy, the ADR, the rev par. Uh, and we're going to talk about all these later, so don't freak out if you don't know what those mean. Um, if I'm speaking a foreign language. Um, but, and so essentially what we're doing is all these reports are going from all the stuff that's happening up in the front office. It's going to report all this stuff to the back office, okay? To the back office. The general ledgers. These are, gonna, these are where we're going to monitor those, those guest accounts. Who's getting close to their um, limits? We need to reauthorize. Um, our, who do we need to build? Does it go to accounts receivable? Does it go to accounts payable? Where does this all go? Okay. And so this property management system manages all of this. Think about maybe, I don't know how long ago it was because it was before my time in the industry. If you didn't have a property management system, everything was done by hand, okay? That would be very challenging, okay? I can imagine a large 5,000 room hotel in Las Vegas being able to function without a property management system, some, some kind of technology helping out, okay? So on the back office side, we have the human resources, the financial reporting, and our inventory, okay? And so human resources, that's where we can deal with all of our payroll, um, and our labor, all of our scheduling. So we have sometimes, have y'all ever heard your manager, whether it's in a hotel or a restaurant or anything, say, I'm out of labor money. I don't have any labor dollars. My labor budget is spent a variety of different ways. It means that they've already spent, they have a budget on the amount of labor that they're allowed to spend based on the occupancy levels that are projected. And so they can't bring in a fourth person to the front desk because they have no more money in their labor budget. And they've already spent that. And so that scheduling is all handled with that human resources software. The financial reporting tells us what, you know, what we've got going on um, as far as financially for the hotel. And then inventory. What types of things do we have inventory at the hotel? What do you think, Anna? What do you think something that we might have is an inventory? Okay, good. We want to know how many bed sheets we have. Good. What else? Um, Marlene works in a hotel, so I'm going to bypass you. Um, Jessica. Like something who would hold inventory? Like what is something that the hotel is going to inventory? It needs to know how much they have in, in stock. Um, what about like, like bills that they put in the Good. So our soap and shampoos, all of our amenities in the in the guest room. We need to know how much we have in stock. So we need to know that, if, are we going to have enough? Do we need to reorder? Do we have too much? Okay. We also want to monitor our inventory because we want to make sure that if we have low occupancy, we should not be going through our inventory very quickly. And if we are, then we have issues. Okay. Um, and so I can't remember, there was one hotel that I stayed at and they actually used tea tree, the Paul Mitchell tea tree shampoo and conditioner. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's fancy, right? And I'm like, wow. That's... But I could imagine that that would be very tempting for a housekeeper to be like, you know what? I'm going to put a couple bottles in my pocket, right? As, as, as awful as that is, I mean, that's $40 for a, a, a large thing of shampoo. I mean, that's not cheap um, and so it's very tempting so you want to maybe have some kind of inventory 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 control efforts um, in place to kind of keep that stuff under control 
And then the last one is our sales, okay? And so sales is different from our traditional reservations, okay? Sales is in a room to deal with those room blocks. Raise your hand if you can remember what the average starting point is for a room block, a room group reservation. Raise your hand if you think you remember what that reservation. Like how many rooms? Yeah, how many rooms? How many rooms? Patricia? I think 10. I think it's about 10. Most hotels are 10. Is that what your hotel is? You guys are hotels? Is it 10 or, 10 or more room nights? For, to have like a room block or a group reservation. Oh, yeah, so usually a minimum of 10 room nights. So again, going back to this situation here, if I'm staying, if I have like four rooms for four nights or three nights, that's a total of 12 room nights. That could potentially qualify as a small room block, okay? Um, obviously, they're usually a little bit larger um, than that, okay? And that has to go through the sales office. It does not go through the front office and reservations. It has to go through the sales office. It has to be approved for that, okay? Um, we also want to look and see what the trends are for the booking process for our groups. Do we have a lot of groups? We have this, um, this process where we know by July of 2018, we had this number of rooms blocked for groups. And in July 2019, we're either ahead of that pace or we're behind that pace. And so we need to figure out what kind of strategies do we need to do to start building up that pace or, or if we're ahead of pace, that's usually a good thing, okay? And so we can track that trend. If we know that in 2019, or let's say, okay, let's, let's go back to this, 2018. Now it's August 2018. We saw a big bump in groups between August and September. So if it's July of 2019, I may not be worried that I'm a little bit behind pace because I know that between August and September, the trend is that my groups are going to start booking. So it kind of helps you identify those trends and having that, that data, right? We also have our group history files. So just like our guests have files, our groups also have files, okay? Do the groups request all Riverview rooms? Do the, groups, do the groups need food and beverage? What did they spend on food and beverage? So that way, if they call back to us and say they call back maybe next year or two years from now, we can look at their history and they may say, you know what, we loved your fajita dinner, so let's do that again. But your German menu maybe wasn't the greatest, so let's see what we can do to, to change that, right? You can maybe look at their history of the files and, and get all that information out. Yes? So if Okay. Yeah. So if the group needs ADA rooms, so she's saying the Hilton Palazzo does not have ADA rooms that have river views. Oh, yeah. And so if the group is requesting all river views, but then they have some rooms that need ADA compliant, uh, then they accommodations, they have to communicate that to that. And that would also be on the part of the salesperson before they sign that contract so they understand that we don't have that they don't have any rooms on that side. Um, and so all of this stuff is automated. Okay, the more automated it is, the faster the more they communicate to the faster the less error for uh, the less potential for errors. Errors still occur, but the less potential for errors that happens if there's if there's more automation. Questions, comments, concerns about chapter three? No?